had to make a little bit of an extra trip there because I forgot that I put my keys in my overcoat. And so I didn't have them when I got up there, had to come back and get them. <laughs> ah, yes, my weekly exercise. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation. While I catch my breath, we're looking at the church at Pergamos, part two. We're in Revelation chapter two, looking at verses two, uh, 12 through 17. Revelation two, verses 12 through 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. And as we spoke last week, we reminded ourselves that the sharp two-edged sword is the word of God. The final authority in all matters of faith and practice is the word of God, not our emotions and not our feelings. And they were setting aside the word of God on very important key moral issues at Pergamos. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. But you know something? Even if the church wanted to use that as an excuse, well, you know you've got to cut us some slack because after all, this is the devil's hometown. Jesus says, I know that. But that is not an excuse for the compromise that's going on in your church. I know this also. You hold fast my name. You've not denied my faith. I know you've had some martyrs there, like Antipas, who was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So twice it mentions the devil's hometown is there at Pergamos. That's his seat where he sits on his throne, ruling the under darkness demons. That's where he lives. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. The doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, the practices of Balaam and the Nicolaitans were a form of false worship and sexual immorality in the church. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's where he started, remember? These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. And here he says it again. I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that once again as we look into your word tonight, you might use your word as a sharp two-edged sword to pierce into our hearts, to the lighting asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, Make it a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Help us to see, Father, where we fall short of the standards that our Lord Jesus Christ has set for us so that we might bear a faithful testimony here in this community, distinct from the world around us and distinct from the compromising churches, which have let it all go to the winds and no longer hold to the truths of moral purity and holiness and righteousness, as well as doctrinal Purity, for they have defected from the faith. They've turned their ears aside to vain babblers and false teachers. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word tonight as it goes forth from this pulpit, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Quick review. As you know, we're looking at the seven churches to which Jesus Christ sent letters via the Apostle John. The first church on the list was Ephesus, the second church was Smyrna, the third church was Pergamos. 
Smyrna, in the middle of those two, was the martyr church. But the first and third churches had something in common that's very striking. The Nicolaitans had tried to infiltrate both churches. They failed at Ephesus, but they had wild success at Pergamos. However, the devil was patient. And in the end, he managed to kill both churches by using different methods. We want to talk about those methods tonight. But with Smyrna, the devil, devil was unable to kill the church. As I told you several weeks ago, there's still an active population of somewhere between 200,000 and 300,000 people in Smyrna today that call themselves Christians, even though they are surrounded by Muslims who would love to kill them. Now, I know that probably not all of them are real Christians. They're cultural Christians. They're in a Christian society within their church confines, just like there may be some phony Christians here, but they call themselves Christians and they mingle with real Christians. But that's a lot of people calling themselves Christians in a very negative culture. So the question that we raise tonight is, why did the devil manage to get Ephesus and Pergamos but failed to kill Smyrna? The short answer is, he used different methods at each church. Two methods worked, one method failed. The method that failed was the method that he used at Smyrna. At Smyrna, he used intense persecution. Now, you should know up front that that is the devil's least effective method in his toolbox against genuine Christians. Intense persecution is the least effective method in his toolbox against genuine Christians. There's a reason. You see, intense persecution has a lot of positive effects on true believers. Let me give you just six positive effects that persecution has on true believers. Number one, intense persecution only hardens the resolve of true believers to be faithful to Christ. That is absolutely true. Every place in the world where there are true believers, intense persecution only hardens the resolve of true believers to be faithful to Christ. Number two, intense persecution only clarifies the focus of true Christians as to what is important and what is worthless in this life. Persecution tends to sharpen your vision. And you begin to realize that the junk that you collect and the things that you put in your pocket, those are not as important as serving Jesus Christ with your whole heart, soul, and mind, because tomorrow you may die. So number two, intense persecution only clarifies the focus of true Christians as to what is important and what is worthless in this life. Number three, intense persecution only brightens the prospect of heaven and makes the world grow strangely dim. Persecution brightens the prospect of heaven. No more suffering, no more pain, no more anguish, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more tears, no more death. Persecution brightens the prospect of heaven. Number four, and this is very important, intense persecution removes the chaff from the church. The pretenders, the phonies, the ones who are not genuine Christians. Intense persecution removes the chaff from the church, the nominal Christians. It leaves the real Christians behind. That way, there's some real benefits to that. The real Christians know whom they can trust, and they really develop a bond of love and sacrificial service for one another. When the chaff is removed, the true Christians know who remains, and that welds them together. Number five, intense persecution only makes real Christians cherish the Bible, prayer, and fellowship more. You know, believers in North Korea 
cherish their Bibles a lot more than you do. They're willing to die for the fact that they have a Bible if it's found hidden under the floorboards of their house or someplace out in their shed where they keep their animals. If it's found, they pay for it with their life. Intense persecution makes real Christians cherish the Bible. It makes them cherish prayer. It makes them cherish fellowship with other believers much more than we ever do. Number six, intense persecution makes real Christians more attractive to their unsaved neighbors who see them suffering for something that is real and has meaning. That means that lost people who are searching for truth will be open to the gospel and will give the real Christians the opportunity to witness. Those who stand for their faith give evident proof that what they believe is true because they're willing to suffer for it and die for it. And someone who's wondering, is there a God? Is there anything worth believing? Is there anything in this world that goes beyond this world? Intense persecution of real believers opens doors. That's why the church grows during times of persecution. That's why more people come to Christ during times of the suffering church than when we have everything we could possibly want like we do here in America. You see that consistently throughout church history. The old saying is true. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So we have to ask a question then. So if all of this is true, why then does the devil still use intense persecution? I mean, doesn't he get up, catch the idea? Like, every time I persecute the church, it grows? Why in the world would he continue to use intense persecution? Not merely put us all into the slothful mode that American Christianity finds itself in today. Why does he use intense persecution? Well, Jesus gave a short answer for that. And here it is in John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In other words, the short answer is, the devil loves to kill God's people. It gives him a kick. It gives him a thrill. It gives him a charge. You know, there are many drug addicts out there who know that it doesn't really work to take drugs and that probably it's going to end up with them dying. But you know something? They keep coming back. They keep doing it. Why? Because it gives them a thrill. Killing God's people gives Satan a thrill. He was a murderer from the beginning. Even though he knows it won't stop Christians, he's a murderer and he revels in human blood. Did you notice something else there? It said he was a murderer from the beginning. That's a reference to Cain and Abel. And it explains why the devil still kills Christians in China, North Korea, and all the Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist countries of the world. You remember what happened at the beginning? And Adam knew his Eve, Eve, his wife, Genesis 4, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain in his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now both these boys knew what God required, because God had clothed their parents with the skins of an animal. Blood was shed to cover their nakedness, their sin. But Cain 
unto his offering, God had not respect, and Cain was wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. The word for sin, there is a sin offering. God brought to him all that was necessary. He didn't have to use the excuse, I'm not a, a sheep herder like my brother. I'm a farmer. God gave him what was necessary. God provided for him all that he needed. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire. In other words, he's not going to resist you. Thou shalt rule over him. Walk over there. Grab that lamb. Take him, slit his throat, pour out the blood. Put him on the altar and burn it. I'll accept it. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field, the Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Murder, first murder in the Bible. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, he takes care of sheep. I take care of plants. I don't take care of brothers. And he, that is God, said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cried unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Up to now, Cain, it's been easy for you to grow stuff. But you know something? Your brother's blood went into the ground. The ground is what you farm. The ground is what you till. The ground is where you plant seeds. The ground is where the crops grow up. Now your brother's blood is in the ground. And the ground, its nature, its character, is going to change. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Remember Jesus said, he, speaking of the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. Now, even though in the physical realm Cain killed Abel, Jesus said that Satan was the real murderer. Satan personally motivated Cain to kill his brother. Remember Jesus' short answer? The devil loves to kill God's people. And Abel became the first hero of faith in Hebrews 11 to give his life for what he believed. Notice also Abel's connection to creation in Hebrews 11. Everything in the Bible goes back to Genesis. Creation is real. Abel is real. Listen to it. Because it talks about the sacrifice that Abel made and what Cain did. This is very pertinent to what we're seeing in Revelation. We'll explain it in just a second. Hebrews 11.3 Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were, made, were not made of things which do appear. Next verse. By faith... Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness. A witness is an open testimony. That's going to be very important to us in just a minute. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Will there be anything when you, as Schaefer, uh, Shakespeare put it, shuffle off this mortal coil? Will there be anything whereby you, being dead, will yet speak? That's the testimony of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11. Abel heads the list. Abel still lives today in the presence of God, and his testimony is preached all over the world. Every place Hebrews chapter 11 is pronounced, or Genesis chapter 4. Now let's look at that for a second. 
because this helps us to understand some of the principles in those first three churches. Cain's offering was rejected because it was disobedience in the details. Disobedience in the details. Now, on Sunday mornings, we've already studied how God expects precise obedience in the details when we looked at God's command to Moses to speak to the rock on the second occasion, and Moses struck the rock instead. As a result of that disobedience in the details, Moses did not get to lead the children of Israel into the promised land, but he had to die outside the land. Our first issue is disobedience in the details. Cain is mentioned in two other places in the New Testament that explain the devil's lust to murder believers. This is why the devil still uses tactic number one, even though he couldn't get the church at Smyrna. Jesus explains it, and he uses Cain and Abel as an illustration. First of all, let's look at 1 John 3.12. Here's the Apostle John, the one who also wrote the book of Revelation. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Ah, now who's the wicked one? That's the devil. Remember, the devil is the murderer from the beginning. That's what Jesus said. Now we have it explained. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And then he answers the question, so why in the world did he kill him? Wherefore slew he him? And here's the answer, and this applies to all of the persecution of Christians throughout church history. Here it is. Because his own works were evil and his brothers righteous. That little phrase explains to us why it is easy for the devil to radicalize both religious and secular unbelievers into murderous acts against Christians. You see, light cannot tolerate darkness. Unbelievers, whether religious or secular, do, whether they like to admit it or not, do in fact have a conscience. Now we already discussed that when we looked at the light God has given to all men in Romans 1 through 3. But Romans 2 is quite clear that all men are guilty because God has given them a conscience to know right from wrong, to know good from evil, and they choose evil. The problem is, at least what they struggle with in their mind is, that men always want to think that they're good. They also want other people to think that they are good. And they especially want to think they're good according to their own standards, not according to some external standard set by God. When you tell people that they fall short of the divine standard and that they are sinning, they get flaming mad. Let me give you an illustration. You saw this illustration if you listen to or watch the news this week. A good illustration of this this week was when Cory Booker was questioning Mike Pompeo in the Senate confirmation hearings. Booker came down hard on him because Mr. Pompeo stated publicly on the record that he believes that marriage should only be reserved for unions of one man and one woman. And Cory Booker attacked him with ferocity. The screaming left-wing pro-sodomite bullies cannot tolerate anybody in government who doesn't bend the knee to support their politically correct immorality. Now we look at the next passage. The Apostle John makes a rubber meets the road theological statement which is right on point. John chapter 3 verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Now here's the key phrase, because their deeds were evil. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because Abel's works were righteous and Cain's works were wicked. And Cain couldn't tolerate the contrast. He had to get rid of the light. Why do men love darkness rather than light? They love it because their deeds are evil. That's why Satan still tries to murder Christians all over the world. 
Jesus put it this way later in the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. But if you follow Jesus, expect the same results that Jesus got. John 12, 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Did you know that you could remain in the light 24 hours a day if, and never get into darkness, if you're in an airplane traveling the same direction as the sun? You'd have to have some in-flight refueling taking place, but you could do it. And you could do it for days, for weeks, for months, for years. But you have to follow the sun. The same thing is true if you want to stay in the light with Jesus, you have to follow Jesus. You have to walk in the light. You can't stand still. Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. And then he explains it in verse 47. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. You know, at his arrest even, Jesus made this same principle very clear. They've come to arrest him. We've had the incident with Peter and the sword in Malchus's ear. We've had the other disciples running away. And John, somebody grabs his cloak and runs away without anything on. And Jesus says, When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Darkness cannot tolerate light. You see, evil people are motivated, and they are indeed motivated by the devil, and they cannot stand it when a righteous person stands up to them and tells them there's a different opinion called truth. They want to imagine that they are good people, but when true goodness is set alongside their dirty souls, it proves they are not good and they go berserk. they just got to get rid of the light that exposes their dirty underwear. Jesus is the example. Jesus was perfect, but the Sanhedrin had to get rid of him because he was making them look bad. And they wanted everybody to think they were good, those pious hypocrites. They were murderers, and Jesus said so in John 8. They were murderers like their father the devil, but they wanted to pretend to look good so that they could get the praise of men. The other verse in the New Testament that mentions Cain and has a bearing on our text in Revelation is Jude verse 11. Now, I read you a long extended passage out of Jude this morning, but I want to just read this one verse because it ties two things together that we see in our Revelation text. Woe unto them, speaking of the apostates, those who have secretly crept into the churches, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Ah, so there we have Cain again. Takes us back to Cain and Abel, first murder. They've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam. Ah, Balaam. Balaam's mentioned at Pergamos. He's in our text at Pergamos. We've already studied Balaam. For reward and perish in the gainsaying of Korah. Korah and his company, the ones who rebelled and badmouthed Moses, said they were going to take authority. There's some application there, too, because of it would apply to what was going on with the division that ultimately occurred at Ephesus. Now, this morning I read the entire passage in Jude because it mentions the war between Michael the archangel and the devil when they disputed over the body of Moses. But as I pointed out this morning, Jude is a warrior against apostasy. And here in verse 11, he's describing the character of apostates that creep into churches. That happened at Pergamos. Every church, just like every nation, has infiltrators who enter the country or the church for the purpose of undermining and overthrowing the country or the church. When threatened with exposure, they often resort to murder of informants. You heard about just, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whenever it was, uh, in Great Britain, how a former Russian spy and his daughter 
were poisoned, and Russia keeps denying it, because they'd gone over to Great Britain's side. And so what does the Kremlin try to do? Murder them. That's very, very common in the international espionage community. When threatened with exposure, they often resort to murder of informants and others they suspect might betray them or get in their way. That, of course, is the work of the devil. You see, we see a lot of this stuff going on today all around us here. But the reason that this verse, Jude 11, is so important is that it both mentions Cain and Balaam. Balaam was the compromising, greedy prophet whom we've studied in detail in our examination of how the doctrine and practice of Balaam mirrored the doctrine and the practice of the Nicolaitans at Ephesus and at Pergamos. But first, let me complete our thoughts about Cain and the way of Cain, which Jude mentions. He says they've gone in the way of Cain. What is the way of Cain? It includes at least three elements, all of which tie into the church at Pergamos. Number one, defective obedience. Defective obedience. Now, you know, God required sacrifices, and Cain did bring a sacrifice. He could argue and say, but I obeyed, I obeyed, I obeyed, I obeyed. It was defective obedience. It was not the sacrifice that God required. Number two, second element of the way of Cain. He was self-willed and therefore had inadequate worship. It was self-willed and therefore inadequate worship when he brought his sacrifice. You see, he determined what he wanted to bring, not what God required. What he wanted to bring was the work of his own hands. And then he got mad that God wouldn't accept it. You see, Cain had a salvation by works theology rather than a salvation by the blood of a spotless substitute which foreshadowed our Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, defective obedience. Number two, self-willed and therefore inadequate worship. Number three, murder. That's the way of Cain. Murder. Now you know, murder can include not just physically taking a knife and sticking it in somebody until their body dies. You can murder people with your tongue. You can murder people with your attitude. You can murder people by the way you shun them and talk about them behind their back. You can murder people by gossip. You know there are folks in this church that do that. Remember, that's the way of Cain. That's the way of Cain. Cain was the first murderer in history of man, and that secret murder, because he did it secretly, he didn't wait until Adam and Eve were walking around and said, look, I'm going to kill my brother. Gonk! That secret murder related to the defective worship and versus obedient worship. That's the religious history of secret murder, and it's certainly in the religious history of the Roman Catholic Church, which is plastered with murder and intrigue. So now let's try to put all of this together as we look at Pergamos. Last week we stopped just short of contrasting why the devil failed at one church, Smyrna, and succeeded at the two other churches, Ephesus and Pergamos. Merely using the blunt tool of murder has never stopped and will never stop the spread of true Christianity. I also told you that we hope to explain the difference in the methods the devil used at the two churches where he succeeded. Because, you see, understanding the devil's methods gives us a warning for what we should look out for. The two churches that fell had problems with the Nicolaitans. Now, you know, nobody goes by the name Nicolaitans today. But there are many churches, especially here in America, that are Nicolaitan in nature. What we've learned so far is that Nicolaitans can be divided into two halves. Number one, evil doctrines. Number two, immoral practices. Different approaches to dealing with the Nicolaitans is key to why one church fell quickly and one church fell slowly. In other words, Pergamos fell quickly, Ephesus fell slowly, but they both fell. Both of them ended up getting wiped out because of what the Nicolaitans had gotten started at the beginning. Ephesus handled the Nicolaitans one way, that is, strict rejection. But Pergamos compromised with them from the beginning in an attempt to remain relevant 
and connected to their culture. Have you heard those terms? Much to the damage of the church. In between Ephesus and Pergamos, Christ sent his message to Smyrna, the church that refused to compromise either in doctrine or practice and suffered terribly as a result. But that's the only church that's alive today. First, even though Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans, that was not enough. Being negative is never enough. Paul had prophesied the defection and destruction of the church at Ephesus in his farewell address to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, and so it happened. And as we said before, that's amazing because Ephesus was the most doctrinally sound church among the seven churches. Pergamus fell quickly, Ephesus fell slowly. So let me make three obvious observations. Observation number one. Sound doctrine will always stand in the way of apostasy and the death of a church and will slow it down, but it will not stop it. Sound doctrine will always stand in the way of apostasy and the death of a church and it will slow it down, but it will not stop it. Dr. McIntyre, as you know, wrote a book entitled Death of the Church, and he details how the PCUSA fell away from sound doctrine and ultimately turned to apostate doctrine, both in doctrine and also in their grotesque immoral practices. Today they support all the immoral, immoral public, pub, politically correct, I'll be able to get my P's out there in a moment, immoral, politically correct positions of our pagan culture. Everything from abortion to homosexuality and many other weird things in between. And I'm sure you know there are free copies of Dr. McIntyre's book out there on the table in the back. So as long as sound doctrine is in place, it will slow the infiltration and dec decay brought on by the heirs of the Nicolaitans, but it won't stop it. That's because of the second observation. Observation number two. Love of Christ is the most important personal qualification for the continued life of the church. That's your lifeblood as a church, is your love for Christ. If other loves creep in, if the first love is lost to the heirs of the Nicolaitans, they will win and the church will defect from Christ and die. The obvious illustration of this is marriage. If other loves creep in, the first love will be lost and the marriage will die. Today, the church at Ephesus no longer exists because they had lost their first love for Christ. We saw how Ephesus ultimately soaked up their culture in the love of a mother goddess who replaced their defective love for Christ. The third observation is this. Ecumenical participation will ultimately water down sound doctrine and will enhance false love. Ecumenism does two things. It waters down sound doctrine and it enhances false love. That happened at Ephesus, as we said, where the Council of Ephesus in 431 introduced the supremacy of Mary. The church then became popular with pagan rulers and we had the apostate and secularists running the pseudo-church. Sadly, in our own day, we saw the same thing happen with Billy Graham. His family started out at the Bible Presbyterian Church of Charlotte, which still exists and is in our presbytery. But ultimately, after his successes, he joined hands with Rome in an ecumenical embrace that said that Rome preaches the same gospel that he preached. No! Absolutely not. The gospel of Rome is not the gospel of Christ. When Billy Graham said that, that's the watering down of sound doctrine and the enhancement of false love. If you read the bulletin inserts that I put in your bulletins, you know that a couple of weeks ago, following the death of Billy Graham, I put in a, an insert put out by the American Council of Christian Churches, a statement on the death of Billy Graham that highlights some of those things for you. If you read the emails that come from Dr. Don Boys, you had a much more detailed insight into the steps of compromise which he made. And at the end, he was loved by everybody. 
And he got the lie in state in Washington. And all kinds of religious leaders from all kinds of apostate groups praised him and patted each other on the back and said, yeah, yeah, he got along with us. Ecumenism. You don't want to be involved in it. In contrast, Smyrna still exists because persecution made their love for Christ burn more fiercely and more intently, even though they didn't have the rich doctrinal heritage of Ephesus. Even though Ephesus rejected the doctrine and practice of the Nicolaitans, Satan used the prophecy, prophesied two things, defection and corruption of the elders at Ephesus to drag them into other false doctrine that ended in the horrible immoral practices like Israel in the days of Balaam. That immorality among priests, prelates, and the top echelons of Rome, including popes, has been the heritage of the Roman Catholic so-called church for centuries. There have been books, many that have been written, that document this, so I don't need to go into detail, but you're all probably aware of all the scandals that have been going on, including some here in Philadelphia, about pedophile priests. People... False doctrine brings false loves, brings immorality. Don't get into it. I gave you five reasons that Ephesus should not have fallen into false doctrine, yet they did. And I gave those. Paul started the church. He ordained the elders. He wrote the book of Ephesians. History records that Timothy was the first bishop of Ephesus close to the time of the death of Paul. Christ himself praised the church 30 years after the death of Paul for their doctrinal stance, but warned them about losing their first love. So the bottom line, the devil finally got the church at Ephesus after a long period of seduction and absorbing their culture through number one, divisions in leadership, and number two, an ecumenical council. Just remember, the so-called ecumenical movement is of the devil. If you let others come in who do not agree with your doctrine and let them participate in official activities that both the doctrine and practical stance of the church, eventually they will come in and destroy the church. The devil likes to steal what God's people have built. He's a murderer from the beginning. He's a thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Ephesus began to lose members through death and attrition. In the changing culture, they were beginning to shrink. We're desperate for members. Leadership was divided. They began to join forces with divergent so-called Christian groups who eventually took over the church and ultimately killed it. What's the lesson? Without agape love for Christ, sound doctrine eventually erodes into pagan sexual orgies and erotic sensual love for pagan gods. And that's how the devil finally got Ephesus, by pulling them to the worship of Mary. Many in the church are doing that today through pornography. Ephesus suffered no real persecution, but they fell and Smyrna lived. Pergamos suffered some persecution, but they also fell while Smyrna lived. At Ephesus, the two keys used to kill the church were division of leadership and loss of love for Christ, even though they rejected Nicolaitanism. Ultimately, Nicolaitanism won and destroyed their church. At Pergamos, the key that Satan used to ultimately crush the church was what the church leadership thought would make the church thrive and grow. I mean, you know, you're welcoming in everybody and you don't want to say too many negative things because then they won't come to church. And so you just let them keep on doing their, their, their uh, dance with the devil, so to speak. And they're wallowing in their filthy immorality. Church leadership thought that would make the church thrive and grow. The assimilation of the culture and a loose view of the so-called Christian liberty. But that's not true Christian liberty. I talked about that this morning. It's only a counterfeit. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. True Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. If you don't know that definition, you should write it down. Christian liberty is not the right to do what you want to do. Christian liberty is the power to do what you ought to do. What you want to do is a statement of allowing the sinful flesh, your old sin nature, to take control of your thoughts, your words, your deeds, your attitudes, and your motives. That will always end in doctrinal compromise. That will always end in the lowering of moral standards. That will always end with a hazy sense of fitting in with the culture. And that will also end, ultimately, with judgment from God and the death of the church. 
That's where the so-called church growth movement of the modern church finds itself today. Ephesus fell slowly, but Pergamos fell quickly because the doctrine and practice of the Nicolaitans was welcomed as the new wave of making the church relevant to the culture took hold. Never fall into the snare of the devil when he tells you that in order to grow, you have to make your church relevant. I heard that back in the 60s when I was in college. The modern church leaders who are spewing out this garbage are the spiritual heirs of the Nicolaitans. Just remember, Pergamos was where the devil lived, and they had Satan's seat. The entire area was obviously a hotbed of demonic activity, just like Collingswood and its pro-homosexual culture. Application. In all of this, as we look at those three churches, in all of this there are some important lessons for us. Doctrine alone won't keep the church alive. We've got our standards. We've got the Westminster Confession of Faith. We've got the longer catechism. We've got the shorter catechism. We've got the Book of Discipline. Just having it all categorized out, neatly typed up, and wedged in our pockets is not what keeps the church alive. Ephesus had it all. Money won't keep a church going. You think about the Episcopal so-called church and its heritage from the Church of England. They got money coming out their ears. But the way that that church has defected from the faith and is passing into oblivion, you could almost fit the entire congregation into a telephone booth. Money won't keep it going. It's people, but it's a special kind of people. If a church is growing with committed people who have passionate love for Christ, it will survive, even with no money and even with intense persecution and opposition from the outside. That's why we here at Collingswood must, without question, focus on two things. Number one, passionate love for Christ. That's our personal relationship. That's the heavenward relationship. That's what we call the vertical relationship, our love for Christ. That has to come first. But the second is the horizontal relationship. We have to reach people with the gospel of Christ, and they have to see it alive in us. If we do that, I suspect that we will probably come under the devil's attack like Smyrna did. But that also means that there will be a long-range heritage of this church even if persecution becomes intense. Three churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos. You know, we have a lot to learn from all three of them. May what we learn be for the glory of Christ and for the good of the body of Christ. And then we can look forward to the crowns that were promised to believers at Smyrna. Crowns for extreme striving for Christ, not for mediocre service. Crowns connected to people we have led to Christ. Crowns connected to ending a life in faithful, uncompromising service. But remember about crowns also, they can be lost through compromise. They can be lost by yielding to the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans which are still present today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word. We pray that as we have given this brief summary tonight, contrasting the three churches, reminding ourselves of the key issues at each church, 
that we, have, we will have learned what is necessary for this church to live and to thrive and to truly glorify Jesus Christ. It comes at a cost. There's spiritual warfare that's involved. Satan is already attacking this church. He thinks because we're small and weak that perhaps he can bring us into a point of compromise and joining together with others who do not hold the doctrine and practice of the word of God, but instead have pulled on to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the practices of the Nicolaitans. And Father, that means ultimately the death of the church and judgment by Christ. We pray, Father, for your blessings on your word as it's gone forth tonight, so it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and we'll turn to our...